Have you been struggling with weight problems for years? Your eating isn't too bad and you're exercising a bit, but your weight just isn't shifting. And you've tried all the diets. Or maybe you've got high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, aching joints, migraines, or spotty skin. Want to know what could be causing the problem? Stand by, Go Healthy For Good starts right now. Hello and welcome to Go Healthy For Good. Meet Daniel Greenfield. As a missionary to Cambodia, his life was turned upside down by what appeared at first sight to be a simple health issue. Watch. I was lifting a rice sack out of the deep freeze. I felt a pain in my back and I wasn't really for sure what was going on so I laid down and after a while the pain started to come into my hip and it would radiate back and forth. I had never, never had back pain before but I ended up there were some doctors down in, um, that came over from America and they were able to do an MRI and they found out that um, there was a lesion on my left femur and the radiologist said we needed to get back to the States in the next 10 days. And so we frantically finished up with the project and turned things over to our student missionaries and were out of Cambodia in less than a week's time. Before my diagnosis, we were lacto-ovo vegetarian. So we were eating um, dairy, cheese, and eggs as part of our vegetarian diet. Life for us was very hectic. Uh, rat race, running the project. We would get to bed late at night, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night and up at six the next morning. Uh, we were, I mean, we, were, we weren't, uh, too extreme with that. We didn't really exercise much. Uh, we have three kids at home, so that kept us kept us hopping. And then we were running day or night with with project related stuff, um, just nonstop. And so, uh, when with with coming back to the United States with this possibility of having cancer, I cut out all dairy. If it was cancer, I didn't want to give it a chance to progress. We got back, and I was anointed the first thing and we ended up going and see us seeing a specialist an orthopedic surgeon that deals with cancers he ordered a bone biopsy for me and we got the results back and it was a type of non-hodgkin's lymphoma a very serious diagnosis on today's show we have a very special guest we'll make some cheese and hear the rest of daniel's incredible story but first the news In the headlines today, Americans need better nourishment from birth, don't hide the salt shaker, and beware the cultures and cheese. US toddlers are more likely to eat french fries than they are to eat dark green vegetables. The 2012 NHANES survey of 2,300 mothers found that de detailed description of what their children ate on two randomly chosen days was revealing. 25% of all 6 to 11 month olds and 20% of all 1 year olds ate no vegetables on the two days in question, though 9 out of 10 had a little fruit or veggies on a typical day. Of the 1 year olds who ate their veggies, 26% got french fries, 16% had deep yellow veggies and a mere 8% had dark green veggies. Comparing data from the 2009 to 2012 survey with the 2005 to 2008 one, researchers found fruit eaters decreased by 10% and dark green veggie eaters decreased by 50%. Even the French fries fell from 32 to 26%. While toddlers are averse to new foods, parents should be prepared to offer them at least 10 times. And bear in mind that the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends veggies at every meal or snack. Only 5% of the salt eaten by Americans is added at the table, which means that hiding the salt shaker may not be the most effective way to reduce our salt intake. A new study has found that 70% of the salt that Americans eat comes from restaurant meals and store-bought foods. 
450 US adults were surveyed and researchers learned that people are eating 50% more salt than they should be and that only 5% of it comes from home cooked food and another 5% is added at the table. An editorial in the same journal stated that if we could collectively reduce our intake of sodium by even 400 milligrams a day, we could prevent up to 32,000 heart attacks and 20,000 strokes each year. That means we need to be diligent about reading labels, choosing low salt foods in restaurants and doing a bit more cooking at home. Antibiotic resistance and potentially virulent strains of bacteria have been documented in dairy products and in the dairy processing industry, according to the findings of a recent Brazilian study. Researchers from the University of Sao Paulo set out to characterize the staphylococcal bacteria that might be found in raw milk, Menas cheese, and the production lines of three different Menas cheese processing plants. Of the four staph species found, Staph aureus was by far the most common. Now this is known to be a highly contagious bacteria and to commonly cause mastitis in cows. Researchers also found virulent bacteria that were relevant to humans. For example, they identified the staph responsible for toxic shock syndrome and antibiotic resistant staphylococci, including the superbug MRSA or methicillin resistant staph aureus, which kills 20,000 Americans every year. These multi-resistant bacteria are well documented in animal products around the world and superbugs are more common in people eating animal products. I'm Dr. Narada McKibben and that's today's Health News. Today's guest is Dr. Neil Barnard, President of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He's the author of numerous books and articles, including The Cheese Trap, which is a great read, by the way. It has numerous stories of people who didn't know that cheese was making them sick until they gave it up. Here, Dr. Barnard shares what diseases might be caused by cheese and why. First of all, hormonal illnesses like infertility or even certain forms of cancer may be linked to the hormones that end up in cheese. How many people realize that cheese, which comes from milk, actually starts in a cow who is pregnant most of the time, about three quarters of the time dairy cows are pregnant, they make hormones that end up in the milk and are concentrated in the cheese. Um, but a much more mundane thing, just weight gain. The average American consumes between 60 and 65,000 calories worth of cheese every single year, and it's similar in other countries. So these are our big problems that uh, we're concerned about. So weight gain and those other things, anything such as, I mean, for me, it's asthma. Do, are there many people like that? Yes. In fact, all the inflammatory conditions, asthma is the classic one, um, but also rheumatoid arthritis where the joints are being really assaulted um, by an autoimmune reaction that is triggered by the protein. In, in this case, it's not the fat, it's the protein in the dairy products. Um, the beauty of this is, though, that when a person makes some relatively simple changes, you pick the, the, the cheese that's made from almond milk instead of cow's milk, for example, uh, the symptoms go away. Now, there's been some suggestion that acne might be contributed by, by dairy. Is that true? Do some people get acne with cheese? Um, we have seen that, yes. Um, and Harvard researchers looked into this and did find a lot of evidence suggesting that not just cheese, but other uh, milk products might contribute as well. Um, and yet, of course, there are other contributors. Hormones may play a part, too. But the bottom line is it's a good idea to get away from dairy products and see if health issues that have been troubling a person might in fact go away, whether they're hormonal, weight related or inflammatory. Hmm. Yeah, that's good advice. Now, what is it in cheese that makes it toxic or unhealthy? Several things. Uh, it starts out with the fat. Cheese is 70% fat, which is huge. It's uh, worse than meat and far worse, of course, than vegetables and fruits or something like that. Um, but because it comes from a pregnant animal, it's got a sprinkling of hormones. It's very high in salt, higher in salt uh, gram per gram than even potato chips or something like that. Uh, and that's because salt is added. So it's the fat, it's the hormones, it's the salt, it's the cholesterol, and it's those darn cow proteins that trigger the inflammation. Not for everybody, but for many people. And what might those proteins be called? Uh, well, casein is the most common one, but there are others as well. 
And the casein is interesting because not only does it trigger the inflammation, but it also breaks apart in your digestive tract to release opiates called casomorphins that may be why we tend to get hooked. Well, opiates will get us hooked for sure. Now it's time to think about this. You ate a lot of meat and seafood at the buffet. There were fruit and veggie options. I thought you were going to be more healthy now. I am eating more healthy, but I figured we paid good money, so I'd eat more of the expensive food like the seafood and the meat. You might actually be throwing away good money by doing that. Well, what do you mean? Come over here, let me tell you all about it. Okay. Well, you know how vegetarians live about seven years longer than non-vegetarians? Yeah, but what's that got to do with my precious money? Well, if you lived seven years longer, you could make more precious money by working. You can also eat more and enjoy more. Oh, I never thought of it that way. Well, vegetarians also have less heart disease, diabetes, strokes, cancer, hypertension, so your doctor's visits will be fewer and cheaper. And I'll take less medicines, require less surgery, not to mention the pain and the suffering I can avoid. There you go. And if we save money on your doctor visits, perhaps I can go and buy those shoes that I've had my eye on. $20 off this week. Oh, so if you buy those shoes, we'll actually put $20 into our bank account? Oh, wouldn't that be nice? If you want to save money, eat more fruits, grains, nuts and vegetables. Doctor's orders. Cheese is very missable. If you're used to having it and used to slicing cheese, you're going to miss it. So Phil and I thought that we would bring you some slicing cheese today. So Phil, read out the ingredients for us. Okay, well surprise, surprise. This has one cup of cashews, half a cup of nutritional yeast, a tablespoon of smoked paprika, one tablespoon of maple syrup, one tablespoon of agar agar powder, or agar agar, one clove of garlic, one lemon juiced, one fourth teaspoon of turmeric, one and a half cups of water and just a pinch of salt. So this is not your traditional cheese. This is completely different. Completely <laughs> different, but hopefully the end product will be something similar. So what I've done ahead of time is just to boil the agar agar in half of that water. And so you want to boil that for five minutes. So we've, we've done that. And then we're going to take it off the heat before we add the rest of our ingredients. So, so what can I do to help you out? Why don't you juice the lemon into here and chop up that garlic clove. Okay. Cashews are a great way to replace your fat. So it's a healthy fat, it's not a saturated fat, and that's the beauty of it. And then by putting the nutritional yeast flakes, you're adding a whole lot of nutrition, all the B vitamins and heaps of flavor. So we're gonna put that in. Then we've got some smoked paprika for some more flavor. You got your lemon oh, juice. Oh, lemon juice. That actually helps to thicken it. And then turmeric, nice antioxidant going in there. Good, good color as well, because we're used to our cheese being yellow. And surprisingly, a little sweetener will help too, to flavor and, and bring out what we're used to, used to tasting in cheese. And your garlic. So this is not just a substitute for cheese. This is, you're getting a lot of great vitamins and, and all kinds of things. It's not just a substitute. No, it's not. Nearly forgot the salt. Now we would really miss it if we didn't put the salt in. So pop a pinch of salt in. Oh, there we go. Not too much. You know, this already smells very good. Like this just is tasty. with all the ingredients. Right. So we're gonna blend that. Oh, I didn't put the water in, did I? Oh, better do that. Otherwise, it'd get a little bit too thick. It will. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll blend that, and then we're going to add that blended mixture into our agar agar, which is the thickening agent. So you want to blend that really well so it's smooth. You don't want to find bits of nut in your cheese. It kind of... It would take away the whole, uh, the whole illusion. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we're just going to pour that in, mix it up, and then what you'll do with that is pour that into a nice mold. It depends what shape you're after. You know, some people like to put it into a square. I use glass dish. 
So some people like it square, some people want to put that into a, um, a round dish. And I feel like with kids, you could do all kinds of things. I mean, I have some cupcake pans that are car shaped and, and you could do anything like that for the kids or the kids at heart that would enjoy something like that. Absolutely, absolutely. So you can get as creative as you want. Yeah, you can. And you can um, just fill, because it's not hot, you can actually just put um, cling wrap, you know, plastic wrap into those molds, or you can put um, parchment paper, you know, so that you can lift it out easily at the end. But it just tips out. So there we have the cheese. So let's see. Now, how long would this be in the form? How long does it take oh, to Oh, just two hours. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Two hours in the fridge and it's ready to come out. Um, but yeah, if you make it at night, you know, it's going to be ready in the morning. So, so this here is go. it? Yeah, let's slice it like it's the real deal. There you go. And you could use this for, I guess, anything that you would have with cheese. Yeah. Crackers and cheese. You can use it for macaroni cheese and things like that, but yeah. Mmm. That's a good alternative to cheese. Yep. That could pass in sandwiches, right? That would definitely pass. Mmm. Good. Daniel, his wife, and three children were very busy missionaries in Cambodia when a pain in his back stopped him in his tracks. The diagnosis was cancer non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Vegetarian before diagnosis, he immediately cut all dairy from his diet and returned to America for treatment. Here's more of his story. It was pretty surreal, pretty challenging for my wife and I because we didn't know what the future was going to hold. Um, our lives had been wrapped up in mission service for the past eight years. The one thing we did know was that we were in God's hands. We, by choosing to be anointed, we were putting Him first above anything that man could, had to offer. Tears were shed. It was it was definitely a challenging thought of going into cancer. Um, we're relatively young, you know, early 30s. It was terrifying. I mean, we have with with having three kids, we had anywhere from four, or excuse me, three, seven, and nine, and the impact it would have on them, the the potential to no longer have them be around, and it was it was rough thinking of that. The oncologist was saying that we would have any like a 70-80% success rate at, at beating this. And I'd never dealt with cancer before. I had no idea the how things worked with this. And I found out from the oncologist that with a blood cancer, it's in my bones. It's that it doesn't have a mass that they can size or a tumor. And so uh, so there was no radiation involved with it, but they they said that I found out afterward they thought it was it was a very aggressive type of cancer, and it was something that was in if they were to stage it it would have been like stage four like like it was it was serious, um, very aggressive. I was on crutches, uh, pain meds very heavily, and it was progressively getting worse. I was in for the start of my chemotherapy. When I was not inpatient with chemotherapy, when I wasn't at the doctors doing follow-up visits, I was up here at Eden Valley uh, doing the, the, um, the fever baths as well as the hyperbaric chamber. And so I was taking every approach possible. Um, I was taking the chemotherapy, I was taking the natural remedies, and we had a support team that went around the world that was sending out prayers for us desperate prayers, I'm sure. Today's guest is Dr. Neil Barnard, physician, researcher, and author. I asked him why he called his latest book, The Cheese Trap. For some years, people speculated, why is it that people love cheese so much? And why is it the food that people have trouble getting away from when they're trying to improve their diets? You know, let, let's face it, it's really high in fat, high in salt, high in calories, but people get hooked on it. And the first thought was, well, it's high in salt and it's high in fat, and those two things tend to lure us into foods in the same way as crisps or chips or onion rings lure us in. It's the fatty, salty combination, but it's more than that. When the dairy protein, casein, breaks apart in your digestive tract, the casomorphins that are released from the protein go into the bloodstream, 
past the blood-brain barrier and attach to the very same receptors on the brain that morphine or heroin would attach to. And we believe that this is a big part of why cheese is addicting. Now, now don't get me wrong, that these casomorphins are not as strong as morphine. The strongest of them has about one-tenth the brain binding power of pure morphine. So it's just enough to make you decide, oh, that was nice, let me have more of that tomorrow. And even if I'm getting a little bit of heavy as a result, who cares? It's sort of a, what we believe a classic drug response just toned way down. So instead of thinking logically about cheese, we are actually illogical because of that addiction. How do we tell if we're addicted? People start rationalizing. They, they come up with all these reasons why, uh, why they should have this stuff when it's, it's really not them talking, it's sort of the addiction talking. Right. So how do we tell if we're addicted? I mean, we all have to eat. So how do we tell if we're addicted to a food? Okay, great question. Um, the first question, or the first issue is, do you crave it or do you really miss it when it's gone? So if somebody says, um, you're allergic to strawberries, um, and does that drive you crazy? Well, if so, you, uh, you might think about it being addictive. Uh, but of course, with strawberries, it doesn't. With cheese, it does bring apart, uh, apart this uh, missing it when it's gone. Secondly, are you on sort of a cycle with it? Do you have it on a daily basis as opposed to just, just once in a while? And third, are you paying a price? Are you gaining, gaining weight? Are you having other symptoms? So those are the issues. Do you crave it or do you miss it when it's gone? Is it on a regular cycle? And uh, uh, also, is it, are, are you paying some kind of price for it, either physically or psychologically? Mm. Those are really good questions that we should all be asking ourselves. Now, you write that fat slows down metabolism. Uh, explain that to us and, and how you've proved that that's really true. It's amazing. Researchers have brought in volunteers and they put them on special laboratory diets that are particularly high in fat. The fat enters the cells of the body and what, have, what they have shown is that it starts to inactivate the mitochondria. These are the part of the cells that cause uh, your body to be able to turn calories into energy. And this happens within three to five days of going on a high fat diet. Now cheese is 70% fat. So when a person is eating a typical cheesy diet, as people do in so many countries now, they're getting a load of fat that Mother Nature never intended that tends to inactivate the mitochondria and your metabolism slows down. So the way you're going to feel this is you're going to say, all right, I'm 40 or 50 or whatever age a person is, and they'll say, I just don't burn calories the way I did when I was 16. It's not your imagination. It's true, and it's the fatty foods that are slowing your metabolism by disabling your mitochondria. Good news, get the fat out, your mitochondria jump back. Now, if we eat a lot of cheese in this country and we're slowing our metabolism down, do you think that that is the cause of our obesity epidemic or, or a significant contributor to it? And what's the evidence for that? Yeah. I think there's no question about it. Uh, for all those people who want to blame sugar for obesity, Sugar is not health food, but it is not the reason for the obesity epidemic. And the reason I say that confidently is that sugar consumption has been dropping since about 1999. So for the past almost two decades, people have been consuming less and less sugar, less and less soda. But where's obesity going? It's continuing to go up. Uh, it's tracking with cheese uh, because cheese has been going up and up and up and up quite consistently all this time. Mm. Uh, secondly, because cheese is so high in fat, it's very, very high in calories. Every fat gram has nine calories packed in. And because it has no fiber, it, it has no plant roughage, it's not a plant. And so the fiber is what your body needs to fill up and push you away from the table. It doesn't have any of that. Uh, plus, to add insult to injury, that extra salt content, and again, it's, it's got more salt than potato chips, um, that salt causes you to retain water, and that'll give you a little extra weight. So it's really the fat that's going to fatten you up and slow your metabolism. And that added water weight just makes you feel kind of bloated and blobby. Mm. Sounds uncomfortable. Now, <laughs> it's not, not a very cheerful thought. No. Now, you, you mentioned the hormone problem with milk, dairy, cheese. Though some say, well, that's bovine hormone. It would be a real stretch to think it could impact humans. What do you say to that? Uh, it's identical to humans. Um, we're, I'm not talking about the bovine growth hormone that's injected into cattle. I am talking about the estradiol that is made in a, cattle's, in a cow's body. 
Um, the farmer impregnates the cow, not personally, but uh, the farmer has, uh, through artificial insemination, impregnates the cow every single year, and the cow is pregnant for nine months and then gives birth. And if you do this every year, you maximize the milk production. Um, now, people who have a heart for animals are concerned about that because the, the calves are always taken away, and it's a bit of a drama, or more than a bit. Yeah, it is. Um, I used to live next who, to a dairy farm. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's creepy. You hear the cows crying out all, all, all night long night for their calves. for three days. Mm. It's, 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 it's frankly uncivilized, in my view. From a biological standpoint, the pregnant cow creates hormones that end up in the milk and they are concentrated in the cheese and they are estradiol, just like human estradiol. And the, the we're concerned about this creating infertility in both men and perhaps women as well. So the less we ingest, the better. Now consider this. Many of us have food intolerance that make us sick and we don't even realize why. Likewise, many of us have dysfunction in our lives that we can't really explain. For some, it's just a niggling uneasiness. For others, it's the achievements that we expected to give us great satisfaction feel like a hollow victory. The story is told in the Bible of a wealthy young man who came running and knelt before Jesus. What must I do to be saved, he asked. Keep the commandments, said Jesus. But I've always done that, he replied. Jesus had been observing this young man and loved his youthful zeal and openness. But he saw that this desire needed to be addressed. It would be asking a lot, but Jesus was more than willing to help him. One more thing, he said. Liquidate all your assets, give the money to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. Boom, this young man was confronted. The crowd fell silent. What a decision. He already had prosperity, status and comfort tangible benefits from this life. What would he do? Could he sell the riches of this life to invest in the next? Carry today's cross for tomorrow's crown? The Bible says that his smile melted away and with a very heavy heart, he turned away from Jesus. He couldn't do it, wouldn't do it. How about you? Are you ready to run and kneel before Jesus and invite him to show you what you need to exchange for eternal life? In Dr. Barnard's book, The Cheese Trap, he has a whole chapter called The Ultimate Processed Food. So let's see what processed cheese goes through. So we'll start with the milk. And usually milk is from pregnant or recently pregnant cows or water buffalo, goats or sheep. Cows are the best source of milk because they each produce about 2,800 gallons, that's 11,000 litres of milk a year. That's a whole lot of milk. Not so much cheese because it takes quite a bit of milk to make cheese, but we'll get to that. Milking cows is a very messy job. I've done it. You end up you know, kind of covered because the milking happens at the cow's rear end. So they've got to heat the milk up to knock the bacteria down and that's called pasteurizing. And we've already done that with this milk. Now, to keep the cheese a consistent texture and flavor, they'll add cream, skim milk or skim milk powder to standardize the amount of fat and protein in the milk. And then you've got to put the color in. That can, if it's yellow, they'll usually use beta carotene or a natto. If it's white, like a mozzarella, they might need to add titanium dioxide or some peroxides. So mm, that sounds more chemical than edible, right? Now, you know that strong smell that cheese gives off? As I talk about it, your brain is probably bringing to you memories of pizza, pasta, or mac and cheese. Well, that odor comes from bacterial cultures that are then added to the vats of milk. Well, you might be asking what kind of bacteria. Well, it depends on which cheese you're making. These bacteria ferment the sugar in milk called lactose, and they produce lactic acid. Now, some bacteria produce bubbles, so you know those cheese with holes in. For blue cheeses, they'll add mold to the interior later on in the processing. For camembert and brie, along with bacteria, they'll have molds and yeasts to give each unique scent and flavor. Mm. There are a couple of unique cheeses that add 
mites or maggots, but that's just gross and people actually enjoy it. Mm. Some popular cheeses have the same bacteria that you find in smelly socks or under your armpit. And now that's gross too, but if you're wondering why some cheeses smell a little reminiscent of vomit, it's because those bacteria produce butyric acid, which is made in your stomach. So there's the connection. So how on earth did we end up eating this stuff and craving it like we do? Oh, well, I'm not sure, but we're finding more about that as we go on. The next step after we've pasteurized the milk, we've added the cultures, we've got that bacteria going, we need to separate the, the milk into curds and whey. Now, I'm just going to add an acid there, which I'll explain to you, but usually they'll use an enzyme for a hard cheese called rennet. Nowadays, rennet is genetically engineered, but traditionally it came from the fourth stomach of a calf, which is why it's often called calf's rennet. Now, soft cheeses don't use rennet. Instead, just like I've just added here, they add an acid to the milk, and of course that makes the milk separate into curds and whey. You can use vinegar, like I just did, or citric acid. Now it's beginning to separate, and you're starting to see some curds appearing there. And that will keep going for a little bit of time. If you keep it on a little bit of heat, then the curds are going to form, and just with time. And once those curds form, we can start doing it now. It's a little bit early, but we'll do it anyway. Then you're going to separate those two out. Now, in the milk factory, it doesn't quite happen like this, but you can do the same at home. I'm making cottage cheese here. You can see why it's called cottage cheese, because you make it at home. And uh, you put it through a strainer like that, and you'll end up with the whey separating out into the bowl, and that's got protein in that we call whey protein. Now, it used to be just discarded, but now they've found that bodybuilders want that extra protein, so they make quite a bit of money from that. And then the curds will become the cheese. Well, you're going to form that cheese into a mold, but you can actually use that whey protein also to make ricotta cheese. Now we've got to this process, we need to add salt because salt is going to stop the bacteria continuing to multiply and uh, destroy the cheese. So we need to do that and of course the salt will add flavour and make it even more addictive. Now, as we moved from milk to this point, we've pasteurised it, fermented it, coagulated it, separated it, salted it and now it's time if it's a hard cheese, not a cottage cheese, we would then put it on a shelf to age. And during that aging process, all that cholesterol probably oxidizes, making it even more toxic. Now cheese has got to outrank every other food when it comes to processing all these different processes it goes through when it coming from milk. But do you know, in that process, we also change nutrients. We have concentrated calories almost sevenfold. And so it takes more than a cup of milk to get one little slice of cheese. We've also concentrated casein, and that triggers for some people migraines, GI upsets, arthritis, skin conditions, asthma, and we also get delayed cognitive processing because of the casomorphine. We'll talk about that another time. Now, we've also concentrated cholesterol and saturated fat. Both of those are linked to cardiovascular disease, and we've added a whole lot of salt, which of course is linked to hypertension. So we've not done our bodies a lot of good. In fact, the amount of salt, you know we all like the salt in potato chips, but they're really salty, right? There's more salt in this cheese than there is in this bag of potato chips. And we haven't even touched on the opiates, the chemicals, the metabolites, and the hormones. So why not make your own cheese from healthy things like cashews like this beautiful cheese block over here. Nuts like almonds and peanuts are full of healthy antioxidants. But not every almond or peanut on the supermarket shelf has the same antioxidant punch. Most of the nuts antioxidants are found in their outer soft covering. When this is damaged through peeling or blanching, half or more of the antioxidants are lost. Choose raw almonds over blanched and enjoy your peanuts with the brown papery covering intact. Choosing nuts in their natural state is another ageless advantage. Now it's time to answer your questions. Here's our first one. 
Keith asks, what foods can be eaten to maintain good health when removing meat from your diet? I recommend you download the free app, Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen. That can be a really good guide to get a well-rounded, healthy, meat-free diet. Here's our next question from Fong. My sister gave birth a year ago, is now feeling sore and swollen where she had stitches. What should we do? It's not uncommon. Sometimes the healing process is disrupted by the formation of a ball of either nerves, endometrium or fibrous tissue called a neuroma, endometrioma or a fibroma. You need to see a gynecologist and have it checked. Sometimes surgery is needed, sometimes nothing at all. Glenda asks, how do you get spore-forming probiotics? Ah, you must have heard one of our guests recommending them as the only useful probiotic. But in fact, from my reading of the research, there are a number of different probiotics that do show benefit with research. But if you want to get the spore-forming ones, go online and you will be able to find them. I assure you, they are sitting there. Now, remember, send your question. We love to hear from you. You can either text, phone us or contact us through the website. Like us on Facebook and become part of our Go Healthy For Good Facebook family. Now, let's see what's in the store. The blackberry grows wild and can be a nasty weed with all those thorns, but it produces such sweet, delicious berries. We're not the only ones that like eating blackberries. So do the birds, the badgers, and even the red fox. And deer enjoy grazing on their leaves. You can see from the dark, rich color of the berries, there are lots of polyphenols like anthocyanins, quercetin, salicylic acid, and elagic acid. They contain a good amount of soluble fiber. And with all the antioxidants, they are good for the heart and also for the brain. In fact, they are the top antioxidant food in the United States. Their seeds are even nutritious, containing omega-3 and omega-6 fats, as well as some protein and carotenoids. A whole cup only contains 60 calories. Don't cook them, just eat them raw. Bon appetit. Today's expert guest is Dr. Neil Barnard. He has led numerous research studies investigating the effects of diet on health. I asked him about the media saying that it's safe to eat butter and cheese and if fat really is the villain that we believed it was 20 years ago. Fat really is the villain just as much as it ever was. Um, particularly saturated fat, that's the fat that's predominant in dairy products, meat, um, and, and some other foods like coconut oil. And there's a little bit of it in chocolate as well, but dairy products are the number one source, at least in the US and, and probably in Europe as well. Um, the industries that profit from these have tried to make this go away by releasing articles saying fat is back and put butter back on your, on your bread and that kind of thing. But there's just no question that it's linked to heart disease and linked to uh, Alzheimer's disease as well is in the most recent research. Um, the egg industry tried to make cholesterol look okay uh, by manipulating the way the research was done. We saw through that um, cholesterol is a problem. It always has been a problem. Um, and it's, the problem isn't going away. Uh, cholesterol is not as big a problem as the saturated fat. That's the dairy and meat fat. So how much cholesterol is in cheese? Um, actually, uh, slightly more than in meat. Um, and about half of the cholesterol you eat ends up in your bloodstream. But the bigger problem is the saturated fat. That's, that's what makes it solid. Um, that's what causes your blood cholesterol level to rise even more than the cholesterol uh, that you're eating. So cheese is, uh, has many reasons why it's gonna affect your health adversely, but it has cholesterol even worse. It has that solid fat. We have all been taught all our lives that we need dairy, of which cheese is a part, to build strong bones. Is that really true? Well, it's true that dairy has calcium in it, but a couple things. First of all, only about a third of the calcium in milk products is absorbed by your body. The other 70% or so just goes out with the waste. You, you never even absorb it. But secondly, and maybe more important, the cow doesn't make calcium. The cow just eats calcium. So calcium is in green vegetables, green leaves, like broccoli or kale or collards or Brussels sprouts. And if we eat those, we get calcium. The cow might be ignoring all those, but the cow eats grass, so the cow is getting calcium. Uh, just from the grass, the cow never makes it. So rather than have your calcium go through from a green vegetable into a cow's body and then into cheese and eating that, the healthiest source of calcium is the green vegetables directly.
Plus, there's a lot of calcium in beans as well as a number of other foods. True. Now, uh, where do these myths then come from? You know that, that, that saturated fat is fine, that we need to eat our cheese and drink our milk for strong bones. Who's generating those myths? Uh, money is generating these things. Um, every industry tries to make its products look good, and the dairy industry are, uh, is, is a group of people who are, frankly, very good at what they do, marketing their products. And I'm sorry to say they have stretched the science. Uh, we actually had to bring the dairy industry to the U.S. government a number of years ago because they were claiming that dairy would cause weight loss. Uh, if you were trying to lose weight, as long as dairy was in your diet, you'd lose more weight than just dieting alone. And we could show that that was a fraud and that all those ads had to stop. But it made us look at all, there are other um, claims such as without milk, you're going to have uh, poor bones. And that just doesn't turn out to be true. Um, now, don't get me wrong. You do need calcium. You need sunlight for vitamin D. You need exercise. All these things are important. But you don't need to get your calcium from dairy and you're better off without it. Mm. Now, as a nation, our cheese consumption is climbing, and it's climbing still. What, what do we need to do about that? Well, you know, it started with fast foods, that there wasn't a burger you couldn't slap some cheese onto. And then pizza became such an institution that that layer of yellow asphalt got higher and higher and higher on your pizza. And so now people are consuming more cheese than ever. And I think we can do two things. Number one is you can just leave that off. But the other thing you can do is you can use various substitutes if you wish to. Uh, so instead of feta on my salad, a little bit of avocado it has a nice taste and mouthfeel, but it doesn't have hormones, doesn't have cholesterol, doesn't have as much saturated fat as, as uh, the feta would. Or if I'm making a pizza, why not have a veggie pizza with extra toppings or a little bit of nutritional yeast, which is a trick a lot of people are using now to get no fat, but all the flavor of cheese, but it's, this comes from nutritional yeast. Also, um, there are some amazing people who are making uh, plant-based cheese. They will use cheese cultures and all, all the procedures for making cheese, but instead of starting with cow's milk, they start with almond milk. And it tastes delicious, it's wonderful, no hormones, no cholesterol. Uh, others start with other foods like cashews and they're making delicious toppings. The idea, try them. Uh, where I think we should be most concerned is with our kids. Because once kids learn some dietary habit, they get stuck on it. And then suddenly a seven-year-old is now a 27-year-old who can't conceive because of the hormones that she's been getting in dairy, at least that's uh, one of the concerns, uh, or who's gaining too much weight, or who's got a high cholesterol level, or in men, our big concern is prostate cancer, which is somewhere between 30 and 60% more common in the dairy consumers compared to the dairy non-consumers. So uh, we want to start our kids on a healthier path, and that really means focusing on the healthy foods and not the cheese. You mentioned that very strong link between dairy and prostate cancer. What is causing that specifically? Well, it's, it started out with just an observation that the dairy-consuming countries had more prostate cancer. And then Harvard University did a large study of 21,000 physicians and showed that the milk-consuming men had more prostate cancer. They followed it up with another even larger study, found exactly the same thing. And the, there are many reasons why. I think the biggest reason is probably that when you consume milk, it triggers the production of something called IGF-1 in the blood. That stands for insulin-like growth factor number one, IGF-1. It's a very potent stimulus for cancer cell growth. Um, growth is good if you're a calf, not so good if you're an adult man. Especially with a prostate cancer. Stand by for more from Dr. Neil Barnard right after the break. Daniel, his wife and three children were missionaries to Cambodia, but their project was suddenly put on hold when Daniel learned that he had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. They immediately returned to America for treatment with both conventional chemotherapy and natural therapy. He eliminated dairy from his diet and focused all his energy on recovery. He also mobilized a worldwide prayer chain. Check out how he's doing now. The six rounds of chemotherapy just kind of brought me a stair-step effect down. And after that, 
I had a stem cell transplant. They were able to use my own stem cells and my rate of recovery was significantly increased as a result of using my own stem cells. I've, I've just progressively been, been gaining strength. Um, you know, I try to do some exercise when I can, when I think of it. And um, even, I'm, I'm over six months out now, and even this morning I went, went for a, a hike up in the mountains with uh, a friend of mine. It was pushing my limits, but I need, I need to do that in order to, to get my strength back. Before transplant, they did a scan and I was cancer free. Afterwards, they've done two scans as well and um, it appears that my body's in remission, the cancer's in remission, I mean. It's been a huge weight lifted off of our shoulders and I, I couldn't have done it with the, without the help of God. Um, my, my prayer support team, uh, the folks at Eden Valley and the doctors, uh, my oncologist down in Denver. I'll be getting my final scan here in another, about another two months and if everything looks good with that, then we'll be returning to Cambodia to the mission field um, at shortly after that. And so we're, we're excited. Mentally, we're preparing for it. Uh, and it's, it's something that we're, we're really looking forward to getting back to. If someone else that has this same diagnosis, I would turn it over to God, pray about it, and then don't self-diagnose on Google. <laughs> Figure out what you're going to do and, and then do it. If you, if you sit and research, you'll be doing that for months and you don't have time to wait. Um, a, a lot of cancers can be fast acting and you need to, need to work quickly. Find out what your options are with your oncologist. Find out, um, look for a place that's similar to Eden Valley, um, a lifestyle institute, and uh, get in contact with them, see what they have to say. Figure out what you're doing, don't, don't wait, um, but, but act quickly. Can't keep a good man down for long. Today's guest, Dr. Neil Barnard, is president of Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which advocates for the humane treatment of animals. I asked him to describe what life is like for a dairy cow. You know, many people imagine that, uh, unlike meat cows, who are obviously killed for the meat, that the dairy cows are not killed. Well, here's what people are, like that are missing. Um, the cows are artificially inseminated every year because if a cow has never been pregnant and hasn't given birth, she's not gonna make milk. Um, but then the calves are taken away so that they can't have the milk and the dairy can sell it. And the cows cry out because you've broken nature's strongest bond, which is the bond between the mother and her baby. I don't care what species you are. Um, and that the, the cow has to submit to that every single year. Um, she's pregnant for nine months out of the year and then gives birth um, and then loses her baby. After about four years, um, the farmer does a calculation, which is that if, if he takes that mother cow who has given these calves and kills her and replaces her with her children and uses the, the, the calves who have now grown up, that he gets more milk per unit feed. So the dairy cows are all killed. In the United States, about 200,000 of them are killed every single month. Um, in India, India is the biggest beef producer in the world, but there aren't any beef cattle in India. They're dairy cattle who are sold off and slaughtered for meat. So all dairy cows are killed, but not until they've been artificially inseminated, separated from their young, and finally trucked off to slaughter. So I have to say that even though I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, and I come from a long line of cattle ranchers who are good, honest people, I've come to the feel that that's really not a particularly civilized way to get your nutrition. And there are better ways that are kinder as well as healthier. What about the milking process? That sort of bothers me. <laughs> you should see it. Um, there are huge farms now. There's uh, one of the farms in Indiana that I visited has a big, what's like a turntable, ex except instead of spinning uh, an audio disc, it's spinning cows. 78 cows fit on it and it's eight minutes for it to turn and then they come off and they're milked three times a day. Before they go on there, sometimes a little flamethrower is used to, to burn off the hairs on their udder um, because those can get in the way and get dirty. Um, and that's what they sub submit to. So it's, uh, when you see it, it looks like there's an animal in the middle of an enormous machine and the idea of respecting your animals, well, that's really gone by the wayside. I have to say though, if it's a small farm and maybe it's a goat farm, they are not any better because they still impregnate the animals. They, it's done by artificial insemination. They still separate the calves away or if it's a goat farm, they take away the kids 
the males are, are killed because they have no use. Um, and the females are going to join the dairying herd, and then they too will be killed. Hmm. Now, uh, cheerful, also, isn't it? Well, yes. Uh, I come from New Zealand, so I've lived that way. Um, yeah. Or I, I shouldn't say I live that way, but I'm surrounded by it there. Um, I when know what I'm you there. mean. Um, but people are also thinking about the environment and give us a comment on that in terms of cheese and eating dairy and and what that how that impacts the environment yeah the environmental impact of food choices are huge and if you could take all the cows let me use the united states as our example uh if you took all the cows in the united states there's a hundred million of them you put them on one side of the balance you put all the humans on the other side of the balance the total mass of the cows is way bigger than the mass of humans and each one is a living breathing methane uh, exhaling animal and methane is by far our most, most potent greenhouse gas. So while everybody's worried about capping smokestacks, which, which is a good thing to think about, it's all those belching cows that are creating methane going into the atmosphere. That's so easy to change. Now, more than that, the cows aren't calling out for room service. They're eating uh, corn or soy products that have been raised for them. Uh, they're typically genetically modified, and it requires an enormous amount of fertilizer and water to produce these plants that no human is ever gonna eat. They're fed to the cows or chickens or pigs or whatever. So environmentalists have been saying for more than a generation that if you really want to care for the earth, we should be eating a plant-based diet, not be eating the animals. And uh, I have to say, even though my own family was involved in ranching for generations, the environmentalists were right. And a plant-based diet is the way to go. Mm. Now, uh, talk a little bit about the work that you're doing at PCRM in helping people to make a change, so kind of giving them that support and that information that they need to make the change, to the switch to that plant-based diet. We have, we have many, many programs, and one of my favorites is called the Kickstart Program. What it is, is at the beginning of every calendar month, you start getting an email every day that has menus and recipes and cooking videos. It's all free, it's not promoting any commercial product, it's not funded by any food company. Um, but this program is available in English, Spanish, Mandarin, Japanese, and a special program for people from the Indian subcontinent with all Indian ingredients. And we've had about 540,000 people go through this. They love it, and doctors prescribe it very often. It's called the Kickstart Program, and you'll see it on our website, which is pcrm.org. So uh, that's what we're doing here at the Physicians Committee. Well, we love it. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for all that you are doing, and I know that you need financial support for what you're doing too, so people can go on your website and uh, do that too. If they have the free program and they're blessed, then I know that they'll want to give back and pay forward. Well, I hope they can, and, and most importantly, I hope they'll share this information with other people. Share it with their doctor. It's probably more nutrition and education than their doctor got in medical school. Yeah. So we'll share this information around, we'll motivate people, and uh, we'll save some lives. And maybe your life will be one of them, like Daniel's. If you have an inflammatory condition, autoimmune disease, or respiratory symptoms, if you're overweight, have hormone issues, or digestive upsets, or like Daniel's, something more serious, then consider switching out the cheese. It's high in fat, that slows metabolism and makes it harder than ever to lose weight. And it's saturated fat, so it pushes up that cholesterol. It's high in salt, that pushes up the blood pressure. There are healthy alternatives to cheese. And if you want support and recipes, sign up for the free online 21 day kickstart program at pcrm.org. That's all from me today. Thanks for joining us on Go Healthy For Good. I'll see you next time.